All right, in this lecture series, we're going to explore chapter six, which is titled Privacy and the Government. And of course, this chapter is from Ethics for, for the Information Age, the eighth edition by Michael Quinn, which is the primary and required text in this course. So the learning objectives that we're gonna get through in this lecture uh, are section 6.1, section 6.2, and section 6.3. All right, so we'll start with an introduction by way of section 6.1. So in general, this chapter six considers the impact that federal, state, and local governments in the United States have had on the information privacy of those living in America. And uh, North America or the United States in particular. So the word privacy does not even appear in the Constitution of the United States. And it has been difficult for the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government to find the right compromise between demands for privacy and competing concerns such as for safety. So we, we're going to survey the legislation that's been crafted or designed to protect the information privacy of individuals, as well as legislation that allows law enforcement agencies to collect information about individuals in an effort to prevent criminal or terrorist activities. And we're going to look at famous examples from American history, um, most likely recent American history, in which governmental agencies engaged in illegal activities under the banner of protecting public safety or national security. And we're going to see how the U.S. Supreme Court gradually shifted its view of information privacy rights over time. So for example, since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, concerns about national security rose significantly at the expense of privacy rights. And a 2006 poll revealed that a majority of Americans support expanded camera surveillance on streets and in public spaces. Uh, the majority also supports law enforcement monitoring internet discussions in chat rooms and other forums, and closer monitoring of banking and credit card transactions to trace funding sources and even expanded government monitoring of cell phones and email to intercept communications. Although that last one is a small majority of around 52%. Perhaps most remarkably, one third of those polled agreed that this use of investigative powers by the president should be done under his or her executive authority without needing congressional authorization at all. So in post 9-11 America, um, the, any abuses by prior presidents of their power, such as President Nixon's abuse, seem like ancient history. So to organize our presentation on information privacy, we're going to use the taxonomy of privacy proposed by uh, Daniel Solov. Solov groups privacy-related activities into four categories. Number one, information collection, which refers to activities that gather personal information. And in sections 6.2 through 6.6, .6, we will focus on issues related to information collection by the government. The second category is information processing, which refers to activities that store, manipulate, and use personal information that has been collected. And we'll focus on information processing in section 6.7 through 6.9. Third, information dissemination, which refers to activities that spread personal information. And section 6.10 will uh, provide examples of this. And category four is invasion, which refers to activities that intrude upon a person's daily life. And, and we'll cover that in section 6.11. So we're going to consider each of these categories 
in turn examining how federal, state, and local governments in the United States have addressed the often competing interests of protecting personal privacy on the one hand and promoting the common good on the other. So in section 6.2, we're going to look at three examples of federal legislation that limit the amount of information private entities can collect from individuals. Uh, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act of 1988, or the EPPA, prohibits most private employers from using lie detector tests under most situations. An employer may not require or even request a job applicant or employee to take a lie detector test, and an employee who refuses to take a lie detector test cannot suffer any retaliation, according to this act. So this law has several important exceptions. Uh, pharmaceutical companies and security firms may administer polygraph tests to job applicants in certain job categories, and employers who have suffered an economic loss, such as theft, may administer polygraph tests to employees whom they reasonably suspect were involved. And most significantly, EPPA does not apply to federal, state, and local governments. The Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, Act, or COPPA, which went into effect in 2000, is designed to reduce the amount of information gathered from children using the internet. So according to the COPPA, online services must obtain parental consent before collecting any information from children 12 years old and younger. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 is designed to prevent discrimination in the areas of medical benefits and employment based on genetic information. So it prohibits health insurance companies and health plan administrators from requesting genetic information from individuals or their family members, and it forbids them from using genetic information when making decisions about coverage, rates, or pre-existing conditions. So it all, it's going to also prohibit most employers from taking genetic information into account when making hiring, firing, promotion, or any other decisions related to the terms of employment. This act does not extend these non-discrimination protections to life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance and it does not apply to employers with fewer than 15 employees. Okay, in section 6.3, we're gonna consider ways in which the federal government has restricted the amount of information that private organizations can collect about individuals. So we're gonna also look at ways in which the federal government itself has collected vast amounts of sensitive information about its citizens. Let's start with census records. In order to ensure that each state has fair representation in the House of Representatives, the United States Constitution requires the government to perform a census every 10 years. And the first census of 1790 only had six questions. It, it asked for the name of the head of the household and the number of persons in each of the following categories. Free white males at least 16 years old free white males under 16 years old, free white females, and all other free persons by sex and color, and then enslaved people. So uh, a terrible list, really, of questions in the first census. Uh, but as time passed, the number of questions obviously changed, but uh, also increased. So in, in 1850, for example, census takers began asking about we're asking questions about taxes, schools, crime, wages, and property values. The 1940 census is notable because for the first time statistical sampling was put to extensive use. And that what that means is a random sample of the population, which would be about 5% about of those surveyed, received a longer form with more questions. The use of uh, random sampling and enabled the Census Bureau to produce detailed demographic profiles 
without substantially increasing the amount of data it needed to process. Now, according to federal law, the Census Bureau is supposed to keep confidential the information it collects. However, the, an exception is uh, in times of national emergency, the Census Bureau has revealed its information to other agencies. So during World War I, the Census Bureau provided the names and addresses of young men to the military, which because they were searching for draft resistors. And after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Census Bureau provided the Justice Department with information from the 1940 census about the general location of Japanese Americans. Unfortunately, the Army used this information to round up Japanese Americans and send them to internment camps. The United States enacted a national income tax in 1862 to help pay for expenses related to the Civil War. In 1872, the income tax was repealed. Congress resurrected the national income tax in 1894, however, but a year later, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. Uh, the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, ratified by the states in 1913, gives the United States government the power to collect an income tax. A national income tax has been in place ever since. So the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS, now collects more than $2 trillion a year in taxes. Your income tax form may reveal a tremendous amount of personal information about your income, your assets, the organizations to which you give charitable contributions, your medical expenses, and much more. The FBI National Crime Information Center, or the NCIC from 2000, is, is a collection of databases supporting the activities of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies in the United States, the United States Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Canada. Its predecessor, the, which, which was called the same thing, uh, the National Crime Information Center, was established by the, except for the 2000, was established by the FBI in 1967 under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover. When it was first activated, the NCIC consisted of 356,784 records in five databases. And these databases or the records in these databases contain information about stolen automobiles, stolen license plates, stolen or missing guns, other stolen items, and missing persons. But today, the NCIC databases contain 12 million records in 21 databases, which include such categories as wanted persons, criminal histories, people incarcerated in federal prisons, convicted sex offenders, unidentified persons, people believed to be a threat to the president, foreign fugitives, violent gang members, and suspected terrorists. Uh, more than 80,000 law enforcement agencies have access to these data files, and the NCIC processes about 12.6 million requests for information each day. So for example, a police officer can initiate an NCIC search during a traffic stop to find out if the vehicle is stolen or if there is a warrant out for the driver and the system responds instantly. Uh, the FBI points to the following successes of using the NCIC. It helps police solve hundreds of thousands of cases each year. It helped the FBI tie James Earl Ray to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and it helped the FBI apprehend Timothy McVeigh for, bom for the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Critics of the NCIC, however, point out ways in which the existence of these databases has led to privacy violations of innocent people. They, for example, they like to point to uh, cases like this where people have, with, with access to the NCSE have illegally used it to search for criminal records on acquaintances or to screen potential employees such as babysitters. The one DOJ database, DOJ there being Department of Justice, managed 
which is managed by the U.S. Department of Justice, provides state and local police officers access to information supplied by five federal law enforcement agencies, uh, including the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the U.S. Marshal Service, and the Bureau of Prisons. So the database is called the 1DOJ, it's, and what it does is it stores incident reports, interrogation summaries, and other information not presently available through the NCIC. At the end of 2006, the 1DOJ database already contained more than 1 million records, uh, but critics of the 1DOJ database point out that it gives local police officers access to information about people who have not been arrested or charged with any crime. The use of closed circuit television cameras for video surveillance in the United States began in Western New York in 1968. The small town of Olean installed a surveillance camera along its main business street in an effort to reduce crime. Within a year, more than 160 police chiefs from around the country visited Olean to learn more about their system. And now today, there are an estimated 30 million surveillance cameras operating in the United States. So the number of surveillance cameras keeps increasing. Uh, New York City spent $201 million to install 3,000 closed circuit security cameras in lower Manhattan. And these surveillance cameras are connected to computer systems with sophisticated image scanning software that can sound alarms if someone leaves an unattended package, for example. And the cameras are part of a larger network of sensors that also includes license plate readers and radiation detectors. The New York Civil Liberties Union has expressed opposition to the large increase in security cameras saying that they represent a violation of privacy and will not prevent terrorist attacks. And they say in support of that latter point that there are 4.2 million surveillance cameras in Britain, one for every 14 people. And it's been estimated that the average Britain is caught on camera an average of 300 times per day. But even with all these cameras, the presence of them and they were fully operational, still did not prevent the suicide bombings in the London subway system in 2005. And so some experts have reached the conclusion that closed circuit television cameras are largely ineffective for crime prevention, and now all they're really doing is violating people's privacy. More than 70% of police departments in the United States make use of scanners that read license plate numbers of passing cars and record the time and location where each car was spotted. License plate scanners typically mounted, which are typically mounted on police cars or parking enforcement vehicles or road signs, toll gates or bridges track the movements of millions of automobiles every year. Police credit license plate scanners with helping them find stolen vehicles and solve criminal cases. But the American Civil Liberties Union has protested the widespread collection of data about citizens who are not suspected of committing any crime. In one widely publicized incident, police in New York City drove unmarked cars equipped with license plate scanners to record the license plate numbers of cars parked near a mosque in Queens. Uh, the length of time that police departments retain the license plate information varies widely from one jurisdiction to the other. For example, the state patrol in Minnesota erases the records after 48 hours, but in the city of Milipitas, California, uh, they do not delete license plate scans and currently maintain a database of about 5 million scans. Several states have passed legislation restricting the use of license plate scanners and or they put limits on how long police can retain the scans. For example, New Hampshire prohibits the use of license plate scanners with several exceptions, including toll booths, bridges, and police investigations that are approved on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Hundreds of police and sheriff's departments in the United States have begun operating unmanned drones. Police drones are nothing like the large predator drones used in Afghanistan or, um, for example, Federal Aviation Administration rules require that drones used by the police weigh no more than 25 pounds and fly no higher than 400 feet and be flown during daylight within view of the operator. Possible uses of the small drones include searching for missing persons, surveying storm damage to isolated neighborhoods, controlling illegal immigration, pursuing fugitive criminals, and performing surveillance at large public gatherings. Some uses of police drones are supported by the majority of the public, but others are not. So in a poll conducted by Monmouth University, 66% of Americans expressed privacy concerns related to the use of unmanned drones with high-tech cameras by U.S. law enforcement agencies. And 67% opposed the use of drones to issue speeding tickets, but 80% supported the use of drones in search and rescue missions. Numerous cities and states are currently debating what controls, if any, should be placed on the use of drones by police. Uh, for example, should police be required to get a search warrant before deploying a drone, or should they be able to use a drone to collect the evidence they need to get a search warrant? Seattle police purchased two drones, but after a strong public protest, Mayor Mike McGinn ordered the drones to be sent back to the manufacturer. Florida, Virginia, and Idaho have passed laws prohibiting the use of police drones for cloud, uh, crowd surveillance at public events.